It's Canada's secret weapon. Oil deposits worth trillions. But getting the crude out of the ground takes the world's biggest rigs and a mega-sized refinery in one of the harshest environments on the planet. The biggest oil companies in the world are going head-to-head -head in a race to build the ultimate oil sands mine. In the shadow of the Arctic Circle, 960 kilometers north of Montana, lies Alberta, Canada's massive forest. An expanse of virgin timberland the size of New York State, undisturbed for 10,000 years. Until now. At the Syncrude Oil Sands Mine, one of the world's largest feats of engineering is under construction. A $10 billion mega project that covers over 100,000 hectares of wilderness. Home to almost 12,000 workers. Masters of the biggest rigs on the planet. Hard at work in the middle of nowhere. Why are they in this remote location? Battling against one of the harshest climates on Earth. Why put up with temperatures that can swing 80 degrees between the searing heat of summer and the deep freeze of an Alberta winter? Because just below the surface of this forest lies a buried treasure potentially worth 80 trillion dollars. It's not diamonds. It's not gold. It's oil. Up to three times what the Saudis have in their backyard. And big oil companies will go to any length and do just about anything, no matter what the cost in dollars or impact to the natural environment. It's a massive undertaking that requires a parade of mega machines and mega structures that scoop, haul, extract and refine. Each element has to work in tight coordination with all the others to make a single giant organism dedicated to just one thing, to devour the sand and spit out profits. Yeah, it's hard to describe a smell other than it smells like money. <laughs> it must be an intoxicating scent because the work is brutal. Nature has definitely stacked the deck against these guys. Because even though one of the richest oil deposits on the planet is right underfoot, it's nearly out of reach. No drill can tap it, because it's not a liquid. Instead, it's a sticky, tar-like oil, called bitumen, mixed with sand to form a heavy, gritty dirt, loaded with potential, but utterly worthless in its natural form. Getting the oil, the black gold, out of this useless goop is imperative. But it's expensive. Each barrel of crude wrested from these sands costs ten times more to produce than a barrel sucked out of the ground on a traditional oil field. Why bother? Because oil consumption has never been greater. And the price of crude keeps climbing. That's what drives these men and women to push themselves and their equipment to the breaking point. The stakes are high, but so are the potential rewards. That's why Syncrude came to these parts more than 30 years ago. Back then, the oil sands business was considered the backwater of the industry. Too expensive. But no longer. Syncrude has figured out how to make the business profitable. Their success hasn't gone unnoticed. Competitors have begun to muscle in. 35 kilometers down the road, another mega project rises from this frigid landscape. Syncrude's latest rival, Shell Oil's Albion Sands. A lyrical name for a 2600 hectare blasted frontier of steel, concrete, shovels, trucks, mud, sand and oil. Shell Oil 
is the new kid on the block. And now they're playing a mean game of catch-up, building their own mega structure. So far, Shell has sunk over $4 billion into their outfit. And now they're going head-to-head -head with Syncrude, trying to beat them at their own game. The winner will be the one who can produce the most oil at the lowest cost and reap the biggest profits. What's the secret? Volume. To make oil from sand, you have to move a lot of earth. Two tons for each barrel. The best way to do that is by using the biggest and toughest equipment around. Like the old joke goes, size does matter. The whole process begins miles from the refinery, out at the vast oil sands mine. After all the trees have been stripped from the land, the digging begins. Every day of the year, they try to rip at least 435,000 tons of oil sand out of the ground. Falling short means falling profits. To get the job done, Syncrude invested hundreds of millions of dollars in some of the world's largest and most expensive mining machines, creating a multi-stage serpentine system for scooping up and transporting oil sands. At the head of that mighty beast, a dragline, a massive electric-powered shovel, standing almost 20 stories tall, capable of scooping 300 tons. That's like hoisting 27... Every day of the year, they try to rip at least 435,000 tons of oil sand out of the ground. Falling short means falling profits. To get the job done, Syncrude invested hundreds of millions of dollars in some of the world's largest and most expensive mining machines, creating a multi-stage serpentine system for scooping up and transporting oil sands. At the head of that mighty beast, a dragline, a massive electric-powered shovel, standing almost 20 stories tall, capable of scooping 300 tons. That's like hoisting 27 fully loaded city buses in one go. It digs out canyons 50 meters deep. The dragline dumps its payload into a huge pile. Food for this bucket wheel reclaimer that eats away at the mountain and transfers the rich load onto a ribbon of conveyor belts 40 kilometers long. When it's working right, one of these systems can move 6,500 tons an hour to the plant. Syncrude originally built four of these monster dig rigs. But things haven't gone quite as planned. Turns out that these muscular machines can be a little finicky. No match for the severe local temperatures. Under the strain of these extreme conditions, the equipment breaks down and cracks up. And whenever any single piece fails, an entire system drops offline, slashing oil output by 25%. So even though they cost hundreds of millions of dollars, Syncrude has decided to dump all four of their dragline systems. This is the last working crane and bucket tandem, and its last day on the job will be year-end 2005. What could possibly replace them? Big enough to do the job, but flexible enough to prevent a costly shutdown. Without a solution to that critical problem, the Syncrude Boomtown would surely go bust. Miles from the Syncrude refinery, the mine was getting by on a hope and a prayer. The massive drag lines, once the pride of the operation, had proven to be its Achilles heel. So engineers made a tough call. Replace these monsters with an entire fleet of more mobile, faster shovels. They're smaller than the drag lines, but at the oil sands megastructure, smaller is a relative term. Meet the largest shovel of its kind in the world. 21 meters high, that's two school buses stacked end on end. Packing 8,000 horsepower, this 1,300-ton excavator is capable of lifting 90 tons of sand with every scoop. 9,000 tons every hour. 
But that would be a pointless exercise if they couldn't get that mountain of dirt to the extraction plant for processing. For that, you need trucks. Really, really, really big trucks. The Syncrude megastructure runs on these mean machines, a fleet of 33 of the biggest trucks in the world. Tipping the scales at 250 tons, each is over 6 meters tall, the height of three SUVs stacked atop each other. They can tear up the gravel at speeds up to 67 kilometers per hour, kicking up a blinding dust storm. Weighing more than a 747 jumbo jet, the truck is so big that the driver barely notices as the giant electric shovel drops more than 360 tons of sand into the truck bed. Running 24-7, 365 days a year, the dump truck fleet is the lifeblood of the oil sand operation. The shovel and truck combo is a dramatic improvement over the old dragline and conveyor system. But nothing's perfect. During the spring thaw, mine roads start to soften up. It doesn't look especially muddy, but for a 250-ton dump truck with 360 tons of sand in its bed, this stuff is as treacherous as quicksand. With 1,200 loads a day moving from the mine to the plant, it's inevitable that sometime, somewhere, someone will get stuck. Like this guy. He's going nowhere fast. There's only one solution. Lighten the load and start over. 200 barrels of oil headed back to Mother Nature. A loss, but it didn't cause the mine to shut down. And even if the worst happens and the truck had become completely disabled, another can rush in to take its place. And the sand will keep on flowing, straight into the mouth of the extraction plant. The last leg of the journey begins here, at the train. That's the name that Syncrude has given to an innovative and expensive state-of-the-art transfer system. The train is composed of three parts. First, trucks dump their oil sands into gate-mouthed crushers that mince large chunks into bite-sized pieces. Next, the loose sands fall onto a powerful conveyor belt that transports them to a surge bin. It looks like a glorified funnel, but it is actually the heart of the transport system. It regulates the flow of sands coming into the processing plant, making sure that a consistent mix of oil, sand and rocks flows just right. Never too much, never too little. Finally, the sands coming from the surge bin are sent to a 42-meter-tall silo called the Slurry Prep Tower, where the sands mix with water and then travel via pipeline to the main plant for processing. Since 1997, the train has run on time. A major success that engineers estimate has cut energy costs by 45%. In fact, the train has proven so valuable that the company has decided to roll the dice again. They're taking a big financial risk by building a new train. It's based on the existing system, so building it should be a breeze, right? Wrong. With a price tag of over half a billion dollars, this mega project is as expensive and complex as a frontline battleship. And getting it built on schedule and on time has been a pitched battle. Just ask foreman Ken Notter. He's the captain in command of the building crew. I got two more pieces to go on this side, two more to go on the west side of the structure here. This week's problem is especially difficult. Constructing the new surge bin, the seven-story tall funnel that will regulate the flow of incoming sand. The surge bin was manufactured in Korea, then broken down and shipped here piece by piece. It took 90 flatbed trucks to haul the hundreds of massive pieces to the construction site. These wall sections that are on the ground down here, they weigh about 40 tons each. Ken's schedule and budget originally called for the crew to work five-day, ten-hour shifts, but that plan went out the window long ago. They've been plagued by gale-force winds that sometimes make it too dangerous for workers to scale the 24-meter tower. 
Ken may be worried, but like any good skipper, he refuses to show it. He wants his team of steel workers and welders to concentrate on getting the job done. Oh yeah, good dude. Oh, oh, fit. Is he joking? Sadly not. Turns out he's got an even bigger problem than weather. Some of the pieces don't quite fit. And that means mucho overtime. Do you have it up tight now or what? Yeah, we tried a pin, but the pin didn't help. Well, maybe we'll get a welder up there and we can weld a dog on it and then we could jack it out. Weld a dog on to which? There, I'll be up there in a bit. Okay. They decide that they have no choice but to try to modify the structure of one of the funnel walls. It's a tricky and dangerous job. They lift 11,000 kilograms of steel slowly, gingerly, until it's dangling high overhead, like the world's biggest guillotine. The crew slides the 12-ton puzzle piece into place. The time for brute force is over. Will it fit? A little tap, and voila. One mega milestone down, and many more to go. But other work can wait. The crew has given all they can, so Ken gives them the weekend off. Syncrude started mining in the 1970s. In those days, the price of oil was so high that it seemed a no-brainer to sink billions into a new technology to wring crude from tar. But then, in the 1980s, the bottom fell out of the oil market. The Saudis flooded the world with cheap oil, dropping the price to just $10 a barrel. Syncrude's oil cost $15 a barrel. In one stroke, their business evaporated and they nearly went under. But rather than pull up stakes and write off their investment, they decided to buy their time. And now, things are going their way. Prices are jumping again, and that's brought in the competition. Shell Oil. They've sunk billions into their own oil sand mine at Aldian. Are they crazy? Didn't they learn from Syncrude's earlier brush with disaster? No one knows what the future will bring. But this time, the picture seems different. Because demand is going through the roof. The United States alone burns 20 million barrels a day, more than any other country in the world. But not for long. China, with its exploding economy, is poised to take the lead, putting ever-mounting pressure on the world to find more oil at almost any cost. Shell began construction at Albion in 1999. It took four years and 14,000 workers to get the operation up and working. They've pushed themselves to the limit and paid a heavy price for their ambition. This is what an oil refinery fire looks like. This blaze filmed at a refinery in Texas killed 15 and caused millions of dollars in damage. In January of 2003, a devastating fire consumed the brand new extraction facility at Shell's site. Work ground to a halt for four months. The company hemorrhaged money while workers repaired the damage. But they got off easy. No one died. What makes oil sand mining such a perilous enterprise? because some of the huge structures that engineers have built are like massive bombs, just waiting to go off. Figuring out how to harness all that explosive power stymied scientists for generations. But it was Dr. Carl Clark in the 1920s who developed the first method. Syncrude was one of the first to put his system to work. The heart of the whole operation is here, in the extraction facility. This is where Syncrude fine-tuned the process and became the largest oil sand producer in the world. A title Shell would dearly love to claim for itself. How does it work? Nature gave the process a head start. A microscopic view reveals that each tiny grain of sand embedded in the oil is surrounded by a thin sheath of water. Without the water, the oil and the sand would be forever bound together. But with the water, the sand is isolated and can be removed. The recipe for separating couldn't be simpler. Just add more hot water, lots of it, some caustic soda, and shake well. 
Every day, nearly half a million tons of sand mix with hot water in these 100-meter-long monster mixers called tumblers. First, the machines shake out the largest of the rocks, violently. With the big stones out and some hot water in, the mix flows into these huge basins called separation vessels. More hot water enters the mix. And as if it were the world's biggest salad dressing, the oil, globules of bitumen tar, separates and rises to the top. With a consistency of molasses, the bitumen froth empties out into collection vessels. From here, the last step is the refining process that produces the gas sold at the pump. The leftover water ends up in waste areas called tailings ponds that stretch for miles. No one is quite sure whether Alberta's forest can grow back in this hellish wasteland. But for some, there's a silver lining inside even the worst industrial mess. Actually, we're cleaning the sand that's been spoiled by nature and put uh, oil into it. And actually, we're cleaning up the sand and putting it back. Cleaning the sand. That's one way to look at it. But no two ways about it. Shell's going to have to clean a lot of sand to catch up to Syncrude. To recoup the billions invested at Albion, the plant needs to produce 155,000 barrels of oil per day. Every day for the next two years. But Syncrude stands in their way. Because the companies are in intense competition for a key ingredient that's always in short supply. Something that neither one can do without, and must pay for, no matter what the cost. Skilled workers. The job of finding and keeping good employees has fallen to Jeff Buckles. So there's just not enough tradespeople to go around for all the work that's planned and, and in progress up here. The other thing is the infrastructure in Fort McMurray is really being stretched to the limits. The nearest town, Fort McMurray, is bursting at its seams. 60,000 people are crammed into what is essentially a frontier town. And it can't expand fast enough. We can get people up from Calgary or Edmonton to come and work here, but this is the fact that they can't find a place to live. Limits how many people we have available to work for us. Housing prices are skyrocketing. And wages are even higher. Thanks in part to a bidding war mentality created by the competing oil companies. Rance Gillingham is a good example. He's been shoveling sand for 15 years. He used to work at Syncrude. Now he works for Shell. It's a safe bet that this top gun didn't take a pay cut when he switched sides. The first bucket is the most critical bucket into the truck itself. But once the first bucket is in, as you can see, there is a, there is a good, good cushion then for dropping the second, third and fourth buckets. Don't let the relaxed confidence of this pro fool you. There's intense time pressure on Rance. He's got just two minutes to fill each truck with four 90-ton scoops. Any longer, and he won't make the day's goal. Today, he's pushing Olive extra hard, because the ground is rock solid. Rance has to crack through the two meters of frost on the frozen tundra. The shovel's bucket is like an ice cream scoop, digging into a frozen pint of oil sand ripple. It takes a master's touch. Once I lift the top off, then the bottom comes out that much easier. So a little, little strategy there. But even Rance can't outmaneuver the sand forever. Because the stuff he scoops isn't only frozen, it's also incredibly abrasive. The shovels dig into the sand with enough power to hoist 200 pickup trucks. The combination of extreme force and rough sand is enough to shred even the steel teeth on the front of these dinosaurs. Every 12 hours, work halts so a team of mega dentists can replace worn out pieces of the shovel. Weighing more than 90 kilograms brand new, a single tooth can lose 27 kilograms in one 12 hour shift. Enough metal is lost into the mine every day to make two full-size pickups. But wear and tear is part of the cost of doing business. Just ask Colin Ashton, extraction manager. He's been working at Albion since before the extraction plant was built. Each day, Colin grapples with a daunting problem. The grit coursing through the plant's network of steel veins poses a constant threat. We're basically processing sandpaper, and uh, that sandpaper goes through the pipes and wears out the pipes in our vessels very quickly. 
Maintenance shutdowns are a fact of life. So engineers built not one, but two independent extraction lines, each capable of processing over 6,000 tons of oil sands every hour. The excess capacity should keep the plant up and running. But during the night, disaster strikes. Line number one goes down with a burst pipe. At the same time, line two is on the verge of an even worse blowout. So Colin has to shut it down as well, putting the entire extraction plant offline. Now the pressure's on to climb into the belly of the beast, to get this line back up and running as soon as possible. Their job, swap out damaged banana screens. Despite the fruity name, banana screens play a meaty role. They filter the slurry that jets through here, separating rocks from oil sand. But the constant bombardment rips the banana screens apart. These steel filters aren't the only weak spot on the system. The abrasive sand moves through the system on a torrent of water. The shell plant uses 19 million litres of water an hour. And the only available source is the nearby Athabasca River. To limit their impact, Shell recycles the water they take. And that has created another maintenance nightmare for the team. They call this the Cyclopack. A half kilometer course of pipe that fires dirty water through these 31 mini pipes, called the cyclones. As water twists through the cyclone pipe, the waste products, sand and clay, fall to the bottom, while the lighter, cleaner water flows out the top, allowing it to return to the system. The Cyclopack, never before used in the oil sands industry, helps clean and reuse an amazing 75% of the water that the plant takes in. But just as with the banana screens, the grit in the cyclone rips the metal to shreds, often causing the whole system to shut down for damage control. There's no easy way to do it. Each time, the crew has to dismantle the beast, clean it, and put it back together again. In this cyclone, the dirty water has savaged the pipe's inner metal and rubber filter. And even more damage further down. That's a cyclone coming out. It had to be taken out because the body's worn out from the sand going through it. It was leaking. It doesn't take long to find the source of the leak. The waste tailings have chewed a hole straight through the thick steel skin. Right here. That's your hole. That's what sand will do to it. And another one bites the dust. And the chances for the replacement piece aren't much better. Most construction jobs end, but here, the building just goes on and on. It's a constant battle, but the world needs energy. Maintenance wizards like Colin Ashton and his team keep the plant healthy. But out on the front lines, the miners face their own troubles. The dump truck fleet struggles to operate at full capacity. Breakdowns are a constant and costly plague. Can Albion find a way to boost its immune system and keep the big rigs rolling? After 12 hours of back-breaking labor, the Albion crew has finished the extraction repairs. And not a moment too soon. Because if they don't restart the plant now, all of their work may have been for nothing. During a shutdown, the oil sand slurry sitting in the pipes and pump begins to congeal. If it's allowed to get too stiff, it could cause the system to seize up like a massive coronary. Here in the control room, Tom Powell oversees the startup. He's like a surgeon, trying to get his patient's ticker up and running after quadruple bypass. His greatest worry is the integrity of the tailings pipe, which carries waste out of the operation. A clog here would be devastating. We're looking for problems with pump box levels, making sure that uh, all the pumps are operating as they should, and that we don't lose the velocity on our course tailings line. Our tailings line uh, is uh, one of our lifelines to our, to our plant. If uh, we lose the tailings line, we have to shut down that train. That train has to go down. We'll wait. The trick is to ease the pumps back online slowly, one at a time. But that's easier said than done as 12,000 tonnes of oil sands have to be sent coursing through the plant's circulatory system. Tom's background as a coal miner didn't prepare him for the delicacy of this job. It was hair-raising because I'm not used to the tonnages. Running 6,500 tonnes an hour, to me, was a half a day of running in the plant. I'm running in an hour on one train. 
slowly but surely, Tom brings the pipe back into action. The 2012 is open. The heart of the plant begins to beat once again. Soon they're running at full capacity. But there's a new problem. The team that controls the workflow of the trucks and shovels is dealing with a major crisis. It just got real busy real quick here. No, I show you going to crash your one. You're just getting no tops. Without warning, all computerized communications to the 20 trucks in the field suddenly go dead. The truck drivers are not getting their assignments. We're showing the assignments, but they're not seeing it come across the screen, so they're kind of lost. It is critical to the mine that trucks and shovels always know exactly which area of the mine to dig and process. If the trucks bring the wrong kind of sand, the extraction plant could clog, and that would be a nightmare. Thank you. Go ahead, Willie. So engineers scramble to get the system up and working again. Frantically, the team tries to radio the drivers to find out where they are and either give them their assignments or order them to stay put. Okay. Meanwhile, the spring thaw is wreaking its own havoc with the trucking fleet. Some of the rigs have been pulled offline and directed here to the mechanic shop for badly needed repairs. Daryl Osachoff is lead truck mechanic. His job is to keep the trucks in the mine and out of his shop. The pressure is on the crew to finish their work as quickly as possible. These particular conditions are very extreme for the vehicle. It's hard on their engines, it's hard on the powertrain, uh, hard on steering linkage. Yesterday, Daryl and his crew made a drastic decision. Replace the entire engine. The truck has logged 16,000 hours. Daryl had hoped it could hold out a bit longer. Ideally, we were hoping for in around 17 to 18,000 hours. But this engine is cooked. A new one, weighing 18 tons, will cost $600,000. And this truck will be out of commission for the five days it will take mechanics to repair it. Basically, we're taking the engine out, uh, the torque converter, and we're changing every hose in here so that when it gets uh, put back to work, it stays to work. For Daryl, saying goodbye to an engine heavier and more expensive than a garage full of cars is all in a day's work. With everything, you want it to live forever, just like our vehicles, our cars, or our kitchen appliances, right? They need to live forever in our own minds, but they never do. Meanwhile, back in the command center, engineers think they've located the communication problem that decapitated the truck communication network. Power went down at one of the substations. Now it's just a matter of rebooting the system, and the trucks can roll once more. Yeah, you betcha. The control room can breathe a sigh of relief. A little thinning feel? For now. It's back up and running perfect there now, so just the way it does 99.9% of the time here. That's why they get the big bucks. They're not the only ones. Salaries for truck drivers can reach over $100,000. Canadian. Wages are fat because labor is scarce. And that scarcity has opened doors for people who might not otherwise get a shot in a place like this. Drivers like Tyler. I'm 19 years old and the truck's $5 million. And Tamara. For two years, she's been breaking down gender stereotypes. The coolest thing about this job is just the reaction on people's faces when I tell them I drive the biggest truck in the world. After a few years of hard work, Shell's Albion Mine Gamble is about to pay off. And they've already decided to up the stakes. Now they're planning a massive $3 billion expansion that will double output to 300,000 barrels of oil a day. Putting them in the lead as the world's largest oil sands mine. But the competition isn't about to take a challenge like that lying down. In the midwinter darkness, a rumble can be heard in the distance on Highway 63. Royal Canadian Mounted Police have shut down traffic in both directions to make way for a massive new addition to Syncrude's processing megastructure. At 60 meters long and over 360 tons, two trucks have to team up to tow this one piece. It takes several days to drive it 435 kilometers from Edmonton. And this is just one of thousands of gigantic new parts arriving here by truck. An isolated outpost, like the Timbuktu of the North, 
It is through these enormous vessels and pipes that the tar-like bitumen flows and is transformed into lighter crude oil in the final stage of processing called upgrading. Already larger than Manhattan Island, Syncrude is expanding its upgrading facility in one of the largest construction projects on the planet. If they succeed, they will double their oil production to 500,000 barrels every day. Take that, Albion. There's just one problem. They've run out of room. So the only option is to build up instead of out. 90 meters up. And that complicates matters for the team that's in charge of constructing the centerpiece of the new expansion project. This may look like a deadly missile, but it's not. It's a 540-ton segment of the plant's brand new coker. A coker is the cooker that refines the heavy tar into a lighter, sweeter and more valuable product. Inside, temperatures soar above 500 degrees. Sprayed under high pressure into the coker, the bitumen flash evaporates, creating a lighter oil vapor. The vapor rises and eventually condenses into the final product. Leftover carbon residue, called coke, makes the way to the coker's furnace, where it's recycled as fuel. The new 85-meter tall coker has to fit snugly into the old upgrading facility. Irv Parson has the job of orchestrating the work. And between the tight confines of the construction site and the complexity of the system he's building, he's got his hands full. We're a year behind or so, so we're not, we'll never be on schedule, but the things are getting done now. He and his crack team slowly hoist the steel, as heavy as 80 elephants. And by day's end, they manage to slide the new coker right into place. The hard part will be hooking it up and bringing it online. For that, they're going to have to get their men into position, high overhead. And that puts the burden on the shoulders of these guys, the scaffolders, the daredevils of the job site. Their job is to forge a path to the hard-to-reach places that the pipe fitters and other technicians have to get to. Scaffolding becomes an inherent part of trying to build these places now. Once upon a time, it was considered a, an accessory. And now you can't build a place like this here without temporary scaffolding. So I want you to go up to uh, level 12, Today, scaffold foreman Kathy Kittycat Bouchard leads her team hard at work 60 meters overhead. They're preparing the way for the final installation of a vital new piece of equipment. Something that won't add to Syncrude's bottom line, but will reduce pollution. This is the best in sulfur dioxide reduction technology. In its natural form, the tar-like bitumen is heavily contaminated with sulfur. Burning it releases the sulfur into the air. Getting the sulfur out before shipping the oil is critical. Some of the sulfur comes out of the bitumen in a molten form that eventually solidifies and ends up here, piled up to form these growing pyramids. Four and a half million tons so far and growing by 1,500 tons a day. Syncrude's cokers release 227 tons of sulfur dioxide gas into the atmosphere every day, a dangerous pollutant that causes acid rain and smog. That's where the new sulfur dioxide reducer comes in and the scaffolders. They lock aluminum beams together with clamps to build this temporary walkway 60 meters above concrete. I'm not afraid of heights, but I have a, I really respect it. I'm always careful, I always tie off, and I'm always watching my footing, and I never take for granted that nothing's gonna happen to me. Just watch your step right here. They knock the last clamp in, right on time. A job well done. Welders will follow to make the final connections that will bring this baby online. It's taken four years to get this far in the construction of the new coker. Thousands of tasks still lie ahead. Pipe fitting, insulating, electrical work. At least another year before anyone is calling this job done. But even this is only the beginning. In the continuing quest to cut costs and increase profits, a mega project like this has to keep moving forward or die.
Within the next 30 years, there will be more mines like this, transforming this frozen forest into the Saudi Arabia of the West. It won't be cheap oil, but it could be a steady supply, with reserves equal to the amount of oil consumed worldwide for 55 years. But extracting that energy is already having an unprecedented impact on the Canadian environment. Trees cut, water diverted, air and soil polluted. The oil industry has promised to restore the wilderness after the mines are no longer active. But no one knows how long that will take, or even if it's possible. For now, though, that seems a risk that the world is willing to take.